Coming up on This Week in Computer Hardware, Samsung S8. This time, they got the batteries right. Patch a game, get a boost in rise of performance. Corsair's one looks gorgeous. Drobo 5N2 NAS and more. It's all coming up next on Twitch. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twitch. Bandwidth for Twitch is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Twitch This Week in Computer Hardware, episode 408, recorded March 30th, 2017. Rising from the Ashes. This episode of This Week in Computer Hardware is brought to you by Tracker, a coin sized tracking device that pairs with your smartphone and keeps you from losing your most valued possessions. Visit thetracker.com right now and enter promo code TWITCH to receive a free Tracker Bravo with any purchase. Welcome to Twitch This Week in Computer Hardware, Twitch weekly show that aims to bring you the most useful, most informative, most engaging, and yes, ladies and gentlemen, most delightful, and some say controversial, hardware news available on the interwebs. I'm Patrick Norton. Joining me is Mr. Ryan Shrout, who is not traveling, and I bet very thankful for that fact. Uh, for this week, that's correct. I thrive on controversy, though, so this I'm looking forward to this episode then. Although, I'm going to be honest with you, I'm looking through the show notes. I don't see a whole lot of that in there, but we'll see. <laughs> You're going to try to toss it up there? Uh, Samsung <laughs> S8, controversially, following the LG G6 into the longer, narrower phone, although with like a 21 by 9 instead of an 18 by 9 screen. Um, yeah, Samsung's recovery. Uh from last year's flaming battery debacle. Uh, one of my favorite uh, articles about around the launch, the announcement, the excitement yesterday was uh, TechCrunch, who basically said, oh, yeah. Yeah, Samsung turned the Note 7 disaster into an S8 feature. Um, <laughs> and that was one of the big things in the, in the S8 yeah. announcement was them being like, you know, we've got this battery thing sorted out with tests and testing, just like we should have done apparently for the S7. But they didn't really mention that part. Um, nice phone. Uh, build quality, which I have not way. experienced. So people, several people I know uh, wrote that this is the best build quality. Like, this is the finest feeling phone they've ever held in their hands. This is mm -hmm. deluxe. Super awesome. Um, you know, in terms of the specs, uh, QHD plus screen, 1440 by 2960. Um, 5.8 and 6.2 inch screens. The S Plus is the 6.2 inch screen, which kind of makes you wonder if there's any point of having a note anymore. Um, 835 processor with uh, 4 gigabytes of RAM, starting at 64 gigabytes of storage. Essentially the same camera from the 12 megapixel camera from the uh, S7. Some updates to the front camera. It's now an 8 megapixel camera. 3000 milliamp hour battery life, but they're claiming it is extraordinarily generous. Um, Edge-to-edge -edge wraparound screen, no home button, but there is an iris scanner. Uh, there is a headphone jack. Woo! Uh, the Bixby AI assistant is a big question mark. Um, mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's going to release uh, April 21st for the U.S., April 28th for the rest of the world, and I believe pre-orders uh, launch on March 30th. Mm. Uh, and I that's, should triple dog today. check that. That's crazy. <laughs> Let me make sure I've got that right. Yeah, well, I I would be disappointed in myself for not knowing if if that were. Oh no, it does say is now live as of 15 hours ago. So okay, I you know I'm going yes. I want to make sure we got it now. But yeah, the 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 fit and finish is supposed to be utterly fantastic. Um, you know, it's uh, pre-order the Galaxy S8, get a free Gear VR, which is a nice little bonus. Um. It is not the $1,000 phone some people were expecting, uh, which I think makes a lot of sense, especially if you're Samsung at this point. Um, yeah, it's, uh, it's looking like a nice phone. It's an Android phone. I know, I know neither of us have, have held either of these devices, but how do you th what, are, what are your thoughts on the bezel and like how you hold the phone? And uh, will you be holding it wrong from this day forward? My understanding is that I will be holding it wrong. Um, <laughs> it was in part of the LG six announcement was LG basically telling, you know, like everybody who uses a phone uses it vertically. You know, the the vast majority yeah. of the time, the, the phone is used in portrait mode. Um, I use the phone a lot uh, in uh, landscape mode. 
which apparently makes me the odd man out. So the whole point of these longer, skinnier phones is to make them still look like they have massive screens, but to make them friendlier to being held and used with a single hand. Um, mm. You know, and, and, you know, the narrower screen that works with the fingerprint sensor on the back, um, you know, the display, you know, it's an OLED display. Um, it's going to look fantastic. Um, technically, it's HDR enabled, but I don't think it's going to matter for the vast majority of the use scenarios. Um, mm -hmm. You know, it's an 18.5 by 9 aspect ratio. Um, it's, I guess the LG G6 is a 21 by 9. So it's, you know, there's going to be black bars for a lot of your content. Um, you know, it's, uh, um, you know, the Bixby Assistant is going to start out in South Korea. Uh, we'll be, you know, curious to see what it's like. You know, can it compete with Google uh, or Apple? I think it's kind of the $99,000 question on that one. Um, you know, at this point, it's not as it dedicated good an as entire Google button Assistant. to it, so they seem to have some confidence. <laughs> I, uh, I have confidence in Samsung's ability to put things in the interface I will neither use, and they will not improve <laughs> to the point where I want to use them. But I'm also a little bitter yeah. about Samsung not offering a pure Android experience at this point. And, and that's in my personal preference. You may think Samsung is the most fantastic interface that's ever been designed for a cell phone. Um, I would prefer pure Android. Um, I continue to prefer pure Android. I don't know how I feel about the rounded edges on that, but um, that's yeah. a personal decision. And I know a lot of people who love the rounded edges uh, you know, on their Samsung phones. That the, the, they love the, the, the edge. Bring it all the way around. Um, you know, at, at this point, uh, I'll be curious, like, you know, is not having a home button going to be a problem for people? Is it going to take time for them to get used to? Um, is the iris scanner going to work? Uh, I'm kind of curious about that one. You know, they're claiming, you know, it's a small battery, right? So the, the, the new chipset's like 10% more powerful, you know, 21% better management of the GPU in theory um, compared to the, I want to say the 810. Um, yep. you know, 3000 milliamp hour battery is not particularly, it's not a lot of juice. Um, nope. but you know, they're claiming every, you know, their, their, their battery claims are robust. Um, they're using the, so they're apparently, you know, doing the same, same process they did with previous phones where the U S model gets, uh, the Snapdragon 835 and the European model and Asian models are going to get the Samsung Exynos SoC. So there's going to be a, a difference in what the performance levels are and kind of fundamentally power consumption uh, and thus battery life. So I'm curious to see how big those deltas are end up are going to end up being. Um, man, where did it go? Um, yeah, they're claiming uh, power consumption is down 20%, um, which is a big number for a, uh, a telephone. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, you know, I love the, you know, the, 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 I, I gotta say the website for the SA, the S eight is an incredible pain. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That doesn't um, surprise me. Cause it's, it's one of those long, like 900 yard long scrolls. So finding any information, um, you know, Back, you know, the, the fast charging looks good. Um, somewhere on this page is a chart of their estimated battery life. And it is apparently not on... Oh, let's try the specs. It is... Uh, here we go. Galaxy S8, 3000 milliamp hours. Galaxy S8 Plus, 3500 milliamp hours. MP3 playback, AOD on up to 44 hours, MP3 play, playback AOD off, up to 67 hours, video playback up to mm. 16 hours, talk time up to 20 hours, internet use Wi-Fi up to 14 hours, internet use 3G up to 11 hours, internet use 4G up to 12 hours. I'm going to assume that's with aggressive turning down of the screen and such. Um, oh, sure. Yeah. But, uh, you know, 10 hours, 12 hours of 4G browsing would not uh, not be bad for a 3,000 milliamp hour battery on the S8. Um, pattern locks, pin locks, password locks, iris scanner, fingerprint scanner, face recognition. Um, I, you know, it looks good. You know, the always on display. Yeah, I, 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 I'm, in, I'm impressed with it. I, I really want to try it. I, I hate the fact that I have to spend $875 to buy the eight plus, uh, and then 
they don't they don't sell it unlocked. Like uh, if you buy it through Best Buy, you have to choose a, a carrier. Uh, if you buy it through uh, either the carriers, obviously you're 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 going to have something carrier locked. So I, I wish they would I wish they would go the Apple route and offer a kind of unlocked version on launch <laughs> option. So. That may be part of their. Do they do they offer an unlocked version on launch from the S7, or is this something new? I, I don't know that they're doing. I don't remember the the S7 <laughs> debacle. Yeah, yeah, that could be too. That that's an interesting thing where they talk about the fingerprint sensor being right next to the uh, camera lens, which could end up being messy. <laughs> no gonna, pun intended. Ah. Yeah, ah, that was a good one, right? Um, never, so, never yeah, had a problem with that. Well, LG G4. Yeah. <laughs> oh, really? The, uh, no, no, I'm, I'm, I'm mocking myself and the fingerprints I would attempt <laughs> fervently to put on the lens. Um, Samsung, they also had the Dex dock for the Galaxy S8, uh, $150, essentially allowing you, you plug the phone into the Dex dock, and suddenly you're rocking the Android operating system from your phone on a monitor with yeah. multiple windows. Yeah, you've been waiting for this your whole life, haven't you? Two USB ports, Ethernet jack, HDMI, USB-C for charging, a fan built in to keep your Galaxy running cool. How crazy is that? Almost as good as You're Microsoft selling the Galaxy S8 in their stores uh, <laughs> as well. The Microsoft the edition Windows of the version. Samsung Galaxy S8. Yeah. Well, you know, you try to help a another massive multinational conglomerate out having a tough time when you can. It's Indeed. the right thing to do. <laughs> yeah, I don't I don't know anybody. I haven't found any single person that's been like, I've been waiting for an opportunity to use my phone as my desktop PC. Um, I will be curious to play. I actually almost want to play with that more than I want to play with the phone just to see if I actually like their uh, iteration of the Samsung as, or excuse me, the Android as a desktop um, yeah, I'm curious. I'm gonna guess you won't, curious. but it's worth a shot. <laughs> you know, you, you may be shocked and surprised that it sucks less than you thought it would. Nice man. <laughs> <laughs> What's up with Ashes of the Singularity? It got a rise in update. Was there a massive boost in uh, gaming performance at 1080p resolutions or any other resolution for that matter? Uh, significantly more than I expected it to be. To be honest with you, so. Really? Uh, but, yeah, yeah. So this, awesome. this first slide is a is a kind of a representation of the problem that Ryzen had on launch day with with gaming performance. At people want to call it low resolution. I do not consider 1080p to be a low resolution benchmark. They consider it to be a reasonable <laughs> resolution benchmark. Um, and so if, if you long story short is, go ahead. Okay, sorry. No, I was going to say like, you know, the number of people gaming at higher resolutions than 1080p. Uh, according to Steam's data, is in the single percent, like in in the single digits. Um, all monitors greater than 1080p or something like four or seven percent of total Steam users. It is a tiny fraction of gamers that are gaming at higher yeah. resolutions. I just wanted to, you know, it's. I had no idea the percentages were that low. Uh, I was shocked. Yep. But. So 1080p, so, still a pretty relevant benchmark. <laughs> absolutely, very much so. And it's not like we were testing at 1080p low quality settings. We were testing at very higher ultra settings, whatever it was. We've had this debate before. Um, and AMD's response at the time was, we're working with game developers to come up with uh, updates to game engines and, and um, you know how they handle threading and how they work with the processor. And there's been you know 10 years of Intel processor optimization and nobody had really spent the time on AMD, you know, on this opt this processor because it's a brand new architecture from the ground up, and you know honestly we kind of took that as yeah sure that's you know that's what they're going to say it's what they should say it's what they did say um, and you know they're, this is their first proof point that mm -hmm. that is a possibility that they, they can actually make drastic performance changes if you look uh, at the results um, we tested. Uh, Ryzen 7 1800X at the high and extreme quality presets at two different memory speeds as well, 2400 megahertz and 3200 megahertz. And the blue bar there is the version that was available before yesterday, and the orange bar is the version that's available today. And you if you look at that top metric at the highest memory speed uh, at high quality preset 1080p, you're looking at a 31% <laughs> change in performance, which is Huge. significant. 
Yeah. From 65.2 yeah, frames extreme to side. 85.5. Yeah. Yeah. And that is and, but, in the but, GPU centric test, not the CPU centric test. So like right. fundamentally what gamers should actually be seeing if the benchmark properly represents uh, real world gameplay. And the other thing that kind of blew my mind was, you know, we, we, we'd seen slides from AMD that said that, that, uh, the Ryzen 7 was going to be more sensitive or take better advantage of memory speed increases compared to anything we'd seen on, on Intel side of the fence. You know, and you look at these two benchmarks, right? It's the Ryzen 7 1800X, the before and after. And, you know, in both cases, you know, the, the previous version of Ash is the singularity. It's 64.1 frames per second with DDR4 running at 2400 megahertz. It's 65.2 uh megahertz excuse me 65.2 frames per second at 3200 megahertz but after the patch is in place not only do you have that 30 percent gain but you have a big gain you know i want to say close to a 10 percent gain between uh between the 2400 megahertz and the 3200 megahertz uh, memory speed you go from 78.4 to 85 frames per second um right. a little less than 10 i mean i was i was kind of blown away to see the the scaling on that uh in a delighted kind of way. <laughs> yeah, and and so it's this this is this is a fantastic result. You see that the scaling throughput there in up to 1.3x, you know, and you know, depending on your memory settings, you know, maybe 15% or something like that is is the delta. Um, does it affect Intel's performance one way or the other, either positively or negatively? And that it, at first it kind of surprised me the more I thought on it, the 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 less it did, right? They're they're clearly fixing things for a specific code path to go through on on Ryzen and and you know they, they may be handling threads a little bit differently now to to better correlate with core complexes on the Ryzen parts and Intel doesn't have that problem so rearranging those threads would have no effect probably on its performance um what I will say you know from this is that it's still only one data point right all these bars represent one data point of one game um that is you know, it's not like a huge AAA title that's like a Battlefield or an, As an Assassin's Creed or something like that where it's this huge phenomenon. And it's and it's not, you know, you can even make the argument that, well, this is an RTS game and it's an RTS game that has always talked about having massive amounts of units on the screen at one time. And it always talked sure. about how heavily it would emphasize threading capabilities of processors. Uh, that's why it was AMD's partner for like Mantle and uh, you know Vulcan releases, and they push DX12. So this may end up being like the best case scenario for mm -hmm. AMD. What they need now is to not sit back and let try to let that sit on its own for months, right? They need to have other game developers that sign on that 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 agree to do these kinds of updates, show that there's performance advantages to be had um, for the long term, and emphasize that you know on, on a regular cadence hey look we know we can't do this overnight we did ashes this month the next month we're going to talk about uh you know a bethesda game because we have a big partnership with them and next we're going to talk with tweaks they made to the frostbite engine or whatever they happen to be they need to do that um so that we can kind of come back and talk about it again so that we can prove to people that hey you know this this problem won't exist forever and it's going to be more important right. as we get into next month when the ryzen 5 processors come out where any argument that anybody had about, well, nobody buys a $500 CPU like a Ryzen 7 1800X and then games at 1080p, which I think is false to begin with. But that argument goes away when you're suddenly talking about $200 and uh, you know, $180 processors. Now you're getting right into the wheelhouse of people that are gaming at 1080p. And all of these metrics become significantly more important for that gaming workload or for that gaming target, that market segment. So... It'll be interesting to see, but this is a fantastic first step uh, from them to to make that case. Yeah, I will. I will be very. You know, we expect end of April, beginning of May, to have the next uh, major BIOS update available for the Ryzen chipsets, which will hopefully make DOCP, for example, on my Asus motherboards function properly, uh, or basically make the chipsets uh, firmware robust enough to uh, overclock memory. Um, because the memory overclocking not working so well for me right now, and I want the extra performance. <laughs> I want all the performance. All right. Um, I agree. Uh, we've been playing around with uh, Drobo boxes quite literally for years. Um, I feel like closing in on a decade at this point. Uh, Alan's got the latest uh, five into five bay NAS review. 
bonded gigabit ethernet made simple and uh bonded gigabit ethernet is awesome <laughs> <laughs> multiple ethernet ports bringing you performance um but yeah it's uh for the most part uh it's a pretty standard Drobo box. In this case, uh, rather than being sort of a personal box like the 5C uh, or a media box like the 5D that I've got bolted next to my machine, um, this is a NAS, uh, two one gigabit Ethernet uh, uh, ports available on it, uh, its desktop chassis. And it's designed for like department work group home media. So big collections of home media, or if you're looking for right. a, a smaller NAS, you back everything up in your small office or house. Um, it's uh, looking clean. I mean, it looks like a Drobo product. <laughs> it does. It does. Uh, worth noting here, I, Drobo is a sponsor on the on the Twit Network, not of this particular yes. episode or anything like that, but but they are. So we make sure we we put that out there in full disclosure. Um, but the that being said, the Drobo Five and Two is probably the most interesting of the devices I have seen in a while because I will I will I will freely admit to being a uh, Drobo, I want to say, like, I wasn't a hater, but I always questioned their devices. They they released one a long time ago, their first network attached, that had a gigabit Ethernet port that only ran at 30 megabytes per second, and it yeah. always kind of rubbed me the wrong way, and they've been making these performance, and adjustments. Performance, and especially in the early days of Drobo, there was a tremendous amount. They traded off a lot of performance in exchange for ease of use with the Drobo dashboard and their management, their software yes. management system. Um, so you Correct. had what was perilously, perilously slow speeds, but if you weren't a network admin by nature, you probably were much more likely to actually have your data to move slowly off of that system. Um, mm -hmm. They've sped things up a bit since then. <laughs> yes, and this this is a good example of uh, of one of those speed ups, right? So there's two gigabit Ethernet ports. It does support um, bonding through their driver. Uh, there's just a simple check mark in the Drobo app uh, that enables network interface bonding. So now you could, in theory, now this can can send uh, uh, twice as much data through the network at one time, either two different machines or the same machine. Um, so th there, there are benefits there. Like now if you have multiple clients, right, you're running this in a small office or a, a, a small business or whatever it is like we use here, you can now feed, I think by Alan's, you know, quick performance testing, you know, you could read at, you know, 70 to 80 megabytes per second per user for two users simultaneously, right? Which is, a, you know, you're running at 150 to 160 megabytes per second, which is more than a single gigabit, gigabit connection will be able to do. So you're fundamentally getting some performance benefit from that bonding capability. And those two systems on the other side don't have to be special in any way. The only thing you have to right. know is that the uh, switch uh, supports bonding, but it's very passed right. through. It's very passive spec. Um, like mm -hmm. I think the switch that we tested through is almost a decade old uh, Netgear uh, here. So I, my expectation is that most of them will will be able to support it. Um, right. But it's I mean, good. It, it's and now, you know, no performance problems. Well, there's always a performance problem if you work at it hard enough, but can always you know, improve, but, but it's good. Yeah. But like, you know, bonded NIC, simultaneous copy from two systems to the FiMed to um, 176.1 uh, megabits per second, like 92.4 megabits uh, per second on one machine, 83.7 megabits per second on the second machine, um, which is a huge increase over the sort of 55 megabits per second you're going to see with a, you know, a single NIC configuration. Um, so it's a nice performance bump. Uh, and I like performance bumps. Um, you know, reading the same file, he was getting like 110 megabits per second on one machine and 112 megabits per second. Uh, that was a simultaneous copy, reading the, basically two systems reading the same file from the 5N2, um, copying from the 5N2 to two systems with the MSATA cache installed, um, you know, helped a little bit, um, you know, uh, it is, is, as Alan points out, uh, quote, those wanting to improve mixed workload and small random performance can also skip the MSATA option and simply install SATA SSDs in place of H HDDs. Um, I think an MSATA SSD is probably much more likely for the typical consumer 
unless they have very, very small, a, a stack of very, very, you know, inexpensive SSDs lying around to do that. Um, it's, but the MSAT it does help with the simultaneous file reads uh, and with random reads overall. Alan notes on that one. Good stuff. Wow. It's 500 bucks or so um, for, I think that's what it was, $500 for the, uh, for the main box. No hard drives included at that price, um, right. which... It, is is actually lower than a lot of other like kind of highly rated NAS box on the market. Um, so it, Drobo, that, that was the other one of the things Drobo's always used to be more expensive. Like you were paying for the user right. like the user uh, uh, capability of it, right? And just the, the how easy it was to use. Uh, but now they have you know more competition has driven them to lower prices and be more competitive, but also improve performance along as well. So five hundred bucks for the the NAS device itself is actually pretty. Pretty competitive um, for a dual a dual giggy system, and then you got to fill it with whatever size drives you want. You know, up to five of them. So, right. this this is a compelling solution. As somebody who That's just came into his people. office today with a network device beeping because some drive, uh, you know, disconnected itself or whatever, and we'd have to rebuild the RAID. This is a very compelling replacement option for that. You know, if uh, if it meets all those particular performance needs you have, editors choice from PC perspective and as Ryan mentioned earlier, Jobo is a sponsor of uh, Twit, but uh, I, I, uh, I'm I down with Alan's review on this one. They're making, they're making good stuff. Yep. And yep. Uh, the prices have definitely come way down. This episode of This Week in Computer Hardware is brought to you by Tracker. They're not under the couch in the cupboard or on the table. Your meeting is in 20 minutes and you can't find your keys. Do you panic? Do you quit? You call in dead. Ha. We've all been there, but now with Tracker, you never have to worry about losing things again. Tracker, it's a coin-sized device constructed with anodized aluminum for the thinnest, most durable tracking. Locate your misplaced keys, your wallets, your bags, your computers in seconds. You pair Tracker to your smartphone, you attach it to any item, and you find its precise location with a tap of a button. It is that easy. Lose your phone, press the button on your Tracker device or ask your Amazon Echo, and your phone rings even when it's on silent. So cool. Your phone can track up to 10 devices at once, and you can customize two-way separation alerts so you're notified before you leave your item behind or before somebody walks away with your backpack or your bag when you're at the airport or in the subway. I like that idea. With over 4.5 million devices shipped, Tracker has the largest crowd GPS network in the world, so your lost item shows up on a map even if it's miles away. The Tracker app records its last known location, and when another Tracker user comes within a 100-foot range of your item, you will receive a GPS update of where your item is located. And with a 30-day money-back guarantee, there is no reason not to give it a try. Stop losing your stuff today, people. Go to thetracker.com and enter promo code TWITCH, that's T-W-I-C-H. You'll get a free Tracker Bravo with any order. That's T H E T R A C K R dot com promo code Twitch for your free Tracker Bravo with any order, and we want to thank Tracker for their support of this weekend computer hardware. I did not expect Corsair to release its own pre-built system, the Corsair One series, and uh, four models. Two are going to be available uh, at your favorite retailers. <laughs> As Jeremy writes up on PC Per, uh, two are going to be exclusive to Corsair's web store. Um, I seven seventy seven hundred K. They're basically integrated liquid cooling for an I seventy seven hundred K as well as the GPU. Uh, whether it's a ten seventy ten eighty or ten eighty Ti, they're all built on a custom MSI Z two seventy Mini ITX motherboard. Corsair Force LE SSD with an H uh, hard disk drive for extra storage. Sixteen gigs of Corsair Vengeance DDR. For 2400, I own several sticks of that, and an 80 plus gold rated SFX power supply unit. And if you scroll down to that second picture there, I love how it's been exploded out. You don't realize how you know it's thin and tall, and that's you know I like the configuration on this. It is I think it's really slick looking. Um, I think it's really a neat looking machine. It is not an inexpensive machine. Um, I bought everything but a new GPU for my uh, a new GPU, and I recycled a Windows license from an older copy of Windows Seven. So, let's say if I bought it, what's what's the current price for a 1070? Uh, mm, 350 or so. 350. 
Is it that low? So now? yeah, I think so. If, if, if I, you know, I was, I was say it's about a thousand fifty minus a GPU and a Windows license. So, you know, I got a a, a, a three seventy. And, and forty dollars to that. I was wrong. Three ninety. Okay. So f- for about yeah. fifteen hundred, I can build a, you know, in eight core, sixteen thread AMD three seventy machine. For a couple hundred bucks less, I can build a sixty seven hundred K machine. Uh, you know, thirteen to fifteen hundred dollars. Um, so you're looking at a premium for this because these machines are running at eighteen hundred dollars with a Core i7 seventy seven hundred and a GTX uh, ten seventy eight gigabytes sixteen gigabytes Corsair. Actually, it's not a bad price, but you are you're paying a little bit for that case. I think it's a beautiful case though. Um, is yeah. it a standard motherboard? It's not a standard motherboard, is it? Oh no, no, oh, no, yeah. no. It's <laughs> it's uh, well, it, it might be. I mean, it could be. It might be a mini ITX. I don't know if I. I don't know if I know that. But the like the design and build around it is clearly very custom, like the cooler and, and the mounting systems and all that type of stuff. Um, because it's a. I think it's like a twelve liter total capacity chassis. Uh, huh. It is not meant to be user serviceable, which is interesting. Because right. Corsair's whole background is in user serviceable components, right? Like that's their that's their upbringing. Um, but this is this is more meant to be for the person that wants to buy a high performance gaming rig for VR and whatever else, and they don't want to break it open all the time. So it's an, it's it's, a, it's a really interesting shift for them. But it is very pretty. Yeah. I agree. Um, it is beautiful. Not inexpensive, but it is beautiful. Um, I don't know that they gave a ship date for it. Oh uh, no! I you know what I don't. I think it's. I think it was uh, for sales. I don't know the answer to that. I'll be honest with you. <laughs> well, let's go to Corsair and search for the one. Um, yeah, I was gonna say they they, they would probably give you some uh, uh, some data there. But uh, let's see, scrolling down, comparing well, models. Well, we're talking about Corsair. Yeah. The uh, I I I did the H. Uh, uh, the H110i GT, the giant dual 200 or dual. I keep saying dual 240 millimeter. The dual 140 millimeter uh, cooler. <laughs> and something I was kind of pleasantly surprised by was uh, between the quiet and the performance settings on that was like a 15 decibel difference, give or take. Oh wow! Um, yeah, probably you know, 12 to 15 decibels. Um, but the uh, so, but I turned it down to quiet, which was under 50 decibels, and and performance was over 60 decibels because the fans are wrapped up at 2200 2300 rpm but the mm. cooling the delta uh in terms of the te- the you know with prime 95 running on a on a torture test to you know burn the cpu to a crisp it was only two degrees centigrade difference between the performance mode and the quiet mode um, mm. which i was kind of pleasantly surprised by so you can go quiet and still get a tremendous amount of cooling out of those giant 140 millimeter fans so <laughs> I do not see ship. Oh, wait, here we go. Yeah, you can order it now. Free standard shipping. Here, I'll add one to the cart. Thereby yeah, yeah. guaranteeing shipping I am divorced up. by the end of the night. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Or sleeping nice. under the airstream. Excellent. Yeah, it's pretty, 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 pretty case. The, uh, man, an Optane. It's here. Well, excited. <laughs> kind of here. I feel. Well, I feel closer. like this is the tenth time they've officially launched Optane Memory. Of course, um, and at least the this ninth is, time we've said that, or I've said that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So this is this is the uh, the memory module, like the M.2 memory, what they call Optane Memory, which is more or less a solid state drive that attaches to your M.2 on a motherboard or in a laptop. This is the system accelerator. This is not a standalone drive. It's only a 16 gig or 32 gig option. Uh, it's meant to act as a cache to a hard drive. They're very specific about that, right? This The target market is not people who already have SSDs, even though Alan and I are debating whether, you know, we don't have it in, in-house yet, like what performance may it actually offer for people with SSDs. Uh, right. But for people with hard drives, this is kind of a, a rehashing of the original Intel RST uh, technology, or it was, I think that was what it was, uh, 
the, the the caching when they came up with the 20 and 30 and, and 40 gig uh, Larson Creek SSDs that were SLC at the time. Uh, same idea here, but Optane's faster. Uh, the software is going to be a little bit smoother and more easily integrated. Um, and the idea is that you know with a 16 gig or up to a 32 gig cache that you can drastically improve the vast majority of the workloads that a normal consumer will get through. Um, they have they have a little bit of data here uh, on their slides that talk about you know um, something that Alan has has been talking about for a long time where the Q depth the Q depth distribution for consumer workloads is very much tailored to like Q depth one two three and maybe four right but really it's just like one and two this is you know how many how many uh, requests for data being written or or read stack up in the operating system before they're actually processed. And uh, it's always in the one or two range for, and you can see in those benchmarks, like they, they do testing in a bunch of different applications like Word and Excel, uh, but also, you know, SolidWorks, iTunes, PowerPoint, Photoshop, um, uh, some, some everyday stuff, OneNote, Windows Media Player, you know, playing back a video or whatever it is. So, and what you get from that is, if you look at the uh, the slide titled QD and 4K random read IOPS, different storage devices, mm -hmm. the, the highlighted green section there on the left is your QD 1, 2, 3, and 4 performance for those drives. The green line on top is Optane memory. The red line is an NVMe SSD. The orange line is a SATA SSD. And the yellow line on the bottom that looks like the Axis is actually a hard drive. Um, so there are significant performance differences on Optane memory, even compared to NVMe and SATA SSDs. Uh, but the big difference is obviously to the hard drive. So uh, their hope is that this kind of catches on as as a cache um, for those purposes. My, I, ha I question the pricing on it for the target markets, right? You think of people who are buying $500 computers that... Right are going to spend 40 to $80 on one of these cash modules. That's a pretty significant proportion of the cost of the system. Um, well, so it needs to be, early, yeah. yeah, I mean, I mean, you mean early in terms of like about, the pricing? Yeah, it's early in terms of the pricing and, and, you know, I, I would be curious to see how many system vendors, uh, you know, pre-built system vendors integrated, you know, if I was able to, to get, SSD like performance out of a four terabyte drive, I think that would be a really compelling way to spend forty or eighty bucks. I mean, and you're also talking about unless some motherboard manufacturer backports it to like NVMe one point one. Um, These um, are all new systems. Yeah, I mean, like, yeah, there's like hundred and thirty something motherboards. They all have two seventy chipsets, you know, and require a Cali Lake CPU. Um, yep. You know, but one of the things that uh, that Alan points out in in the write up is that. You know, it is possible that motherboard makers could backport the required NVMe uh, version 1.1 and Intel RST 15.5 requirements into older systems. I don't think that's happening. <laughs> uh, I don't it would think be so nice either. if it happened, considering yeah. I've got you know 6700 and 6700K uh, lying around. But um, you know, I don't think I don't I don't think it's a bad idea for a product. Uh, it'll be curious. I'll be curious to see if they can manage to push the pricing down on this and how fast they will do that. Yeah. 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 I, 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 this to me is fundamentally less exciting than, you know, the, the enterprise drive we talked about last week or the pending yeah. SSDs, like full SSDs are based on this, but I'm not its target market necessarily, but you know, a lot of laptops that launched at CES were talking about having Intel Optane memory support and then whatever Optane memory launched. So I'll be curious to see like the next Lenovo ThinkPad I get in. Will it have Optane memory in it? And uh, the XPS 13s and 15s refreshes, will they have Optane memory in it? And what kind of effect will that have on the experience and performance that you get on those devices? So we'll uh, we'll see soon. We will. The uh, Lexar jump drives, Sebastian wrote this up. Um, he has the, it's, uh, man, USB 3.0 flash drive, 32 gigabytes uh, uh, for 20 bucks. Uh, there's also 64 and 128 gigabyte versions of the jump drive P20. Uh, advertised claim speeds of 400 megabytes per second from all three and reads of up to 275, uh, excuse me, and up to 275 megabyte per second writes if you buy the 128 gigabyte version of it. 
Um, his hmm. 32 gigabyte model, the least expensive one, the $20 model, uh, was getting 140 megabyte per second reads, uh, which is pretty awesome. Uh, and as Sebastian notes, faster than any USB drive I've ever owned. Even his SanDisk Extreme USB 3.0 16 gigabyte drive was limited to 60 megabyte per second writes uh, and can hit about 190 megabyte per second reads. So yeah. the P20 is basically getting near the, the 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 lower end of SATA 3 SSDs, so at least in theory. <laughs> right. And he bought this out of pocket. His hard-earned $20 was at stake. Um <laughs> You know, I also love that he points out as a public service announcement, there's no reason to purchase this or any other high-speed drive and use it with the Windows default settings, which are optimized for fast removal and not high performance. Compared to a hard drive, Windows treats a USB drive differently unless you manually change the hardware mode. I changed the drive to the high-performance mm -hmm. mode and got started. So, you know, right-click, mm -hmm. properties, policies, uh, and better performance, Interesting. which enables right caching in Windows. Um but you have to use the safely remove hardware notification icon to remove the device safely, i.e. so you don't rip it out while it's still getting things copied on that one. Um, yeah. Lots of benchmarks, which I love. Um, you know, $19.73 on Amazon.com for the 32 gigabyte version, um, and he hit 400 megabytes per second on reads, uh, and the write speeds were good to 50 bucks for 128 gigabytes uh, a USB 3.0 SSD with pretty amazing performance. I'm excited. Like, right up there, man, looking at the ATTO, uh, oh, those are the read results, sorry. <laughs> I, thought I, was, I thought I was looking at 400 megabyte per second write results. It's like, wow. But, uh, yeah, high sustained speeds. It looks like a winner, and it gets an editor's uh, choice from PC perspective. Man, remember when 128 gigabyte drives for like 100, 150 bucks? Yeah, I mean, 20 bucks for that is is pretty good. And I think on Amazon, yeah. that 128 gig model is actually selling for $45. So depending mm. on how much capacity you need, not how much capacity you want, uh, it should be good. The uh, Phenonic Hex 2.0 Peltier or thermoelectric cooler, right, where it applies power to material that essentially acts as the cooling plate. And when you apply power to the material, one side of it, hopefully the side next to the processor gets colder, the other side exhausts heat. Uh, what was the story? How was the performance on this? Um, I would say performance was just okay. Uh, you know, considering how fancy the the cooling mechanics are, the physics behind it are, uh, you know, thermoelectric coolers are not very commonplace. Um, the performance was lower than I expected, for sure. Uh, so it's it's kind of a dual device. It will operate as just a heat sink with the fan, which is actually in the middle in that black enclosed plastic section. Um, if I think if you scroll down a little bit, you can see, uh, uh, or I, I'm sorry, it's on the second page. You can see a picture of the fan in there. So it'll operate as like a normal heat sink mode in some instances. And then when it needs more thermal cooling or more power, uh, to, to get out of the system. It can operate on the thermoelectric side of things, which is interesting because you don't often see heat sinks that have both a four-pin connector for the fan, uh, a USB port for connection to your motherboard for software, and a six-pin PCI Express plug for power, meaning that it's, you know, it's a significant amount of power. It's not, uh, it's not just taking like a Molex or a SATA connector or something like that like a typical fan would do. Um, Performance-wise... In terms of both noise and actually cooling capability, it falls somewhere between a good air cooler and a good self-contained water cooler. Uh, he compared it to the Corsair H75 and the Noctua NH-U9S. Um, and depending on the mode you had it in, standard or insane, uh, for the Hex 2.0, because that's how all setting options need to be decided upon now, uh, you're looking at temperatures that are you know, competitive against... Uh, those options at stock settings and a little bit more competitive when overclocked uh, because the thermoelectric stuff can kind of work some of its magic in that regard. It's also pretty pricey at $148. Um, the, the one kind of saving grace for this product really is that you can get a, it's, it's, it's big, but it's pretty small and it 
it, can, it it's big in terms of heat sinks. It's small in terms of like active cooling, like water cooling or or anything like that. So you're actually you can get better than heat sink cooling capability in a smaller space than you could with having to install something like a Corsair H75, right? And a lot of times if you're in mini ITX designs or certain chassis configurations, like water cooling is either just a pain to install or impossible to install. In this is not, right? It really just mounts to the motherboard into the processor like any other heat sink. You just have the the, the added hassle of two extra cables to connect to it, but it really shouldn't uh, that be a holdup. So, you know, if you have a... Uh, unique product for like a specific purpose that's kind of what this is right this is it's you have to have the right need for it and you have to be willing to pay for it because it's expensive and it doesn't really wow you by looking at the results or anything like that so right. uh not a shock not a shock at all one last uh, story before we head out big 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 update to google home um or like to think of their first big step to catching up with uh, Amazon's uh, Echo and Alaska. Uh, um, but you'll be able to get a voice command to Google Assistant, um, you know, basically talk to the Google Home smart speaker and control devices from August, LifeX, Wink, Rachio, TP-Link, First Alert, Vivint, Best Buy Insignia, Frigidaire, Innova, Genie, and Logitech Harmony. This is uh, the first big update to the smart speaker um, since its launch. Launched, of course, with Nest, Philips Hue, Smart Things, and If This Then That, um, you know, and uh, it's uh, they've been slowly gaining ground, right? Uh, a few announcements in January: Belkin, Wemo, uh, and Honeywell came after CES. So this is this is good. Slowly but surely, Google's going to try to grind out catching up. Uh, Wink's a big gain. Uh, because it uh, hmm. controls so many devices, I think. Um, August is the first lock to work with Google Home. Um, I still think the idea of buying bulbs, which you just saw that red thing, was a bulb from TP-Link, which always seems kind of peculiar to me. Uh, you know, buying yeah. bulbs, router manufacturer. But smart bulbs are now supposed to be available at Ikea. <laughs> so I guess smart bulbs are literally going to be everywhere, uh, except yeah. for, you know, in the supermarket, two in the morning when you need one. But... Uh, yeah, it's uh, the game of catch up and the battle for voice control in the living room mm -hmm. is uh, is closing just a little bit more. So it's it, the the whole smart things discussion still like grinds me. It's not upsetting; it's just aggravating because there's there's so many different options and so many different standards. Different things can talk to different things in different ways. I was, you know, I mean, even the Samsung Galaxy S8 we talked about at the beginning of the show. Um, is like labeled as a Samsung smart things controller. It has like built in apps and capabilities that previous phones didn't have in order to control the things that work in its ecosystem. Um, I don't, I think we're like a, a long way from any kind of standardization on this mm -hmm. stuff. I thought maybe getting uh, in other, in like other phones would be part of that transition into a standardized place. Uh, but then you see like Google Assistant, like now people want Google Assistant to kind of take over in the Android space. And that's not really happening either, you know, because now you got Bixby on, on Samsung side. So there's right. there's there's so much different stuff happening. It almost seems crazy to put your money behind any one of these systems at this point because you just don't know how it's going to end up. No, and I think it's that's always been the issue with any kind of home automation system. You either sort of like, you know, throw your giant check down and let somebody configure a $10,000 system for you, or you work with whatever obscure products you could cobble together. Obscure is kind of a cruel world. Um, most of the products are mainstream. I mean, you can go to Home Depot and buy some really, really functional stuff uh, fairly affordably at this point. But um, we'll see. At least at this point, we've gone kind of full circle from, you know, we're going to do a proprietary control system to, oh, uh, Home Depot and Lowe's are each going to have sort of be affiliated with a semi-proprietary control system to, okay, let's try to make all of our home automation systems work with all of the available products out there. Or in this case, the voice control that works with the home automation systems uh, compatible with as many products as possible. Mm -hmm. I think it's a good step. I think it's a step in the right direction. Um, but, you know, Google Home is, you know, still has a fair amount of catching up to do with with Amazon Echo or Amazon Pascal. But it's nice to see them moving in the right direction. 
in the right direction. Indeed. Indeed. Oh, my goodness. Tweets at Patrick Norton or at Ryan Shrout. If you got a hardware question for us, we'd love to hear. You can find Mr. Shrout at PCPer.com, getting his benchmarks on and raising cane with the hardware world and weeping while he purchases a uh, Samsung S8. Uh, you can find me at uh, techthing.com or avxcel.com where I talk about uh, technology on one and home theater and audio and headphones on the other. And as always, we want to thank you for listening to This Week in Computer Hardware. You can find all of our older episodes and information on how to subscribe to the show at twit.tv slash twitch. That's twit.tv slash T-W-I-C-H. We want to thank each and every one of you for listening, and we appreciate it, and uh, hope it was worth your time. I'm Patrick Norton. I'm Ryan Schrout. We'll see you next week on Twitch. Twitch.